verse number 25, Proverbs chapter number 14. The Bible says, A true witness delivereth souls, but a deceitful witness speaketh lies. As I read this verse, the first thought that came to mind was that of a courtroom. Let me paint you a picture. We know that the Bible tells us that Jesus is our advocate with the Father, that He's seated at the right hand of God, ever making intercession for us, meaning that not only does He advocate for us, He prays for us. The Bible also tells us that the devil, we know, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, as Peter told us. But we also know from the book of Job, God asked Satan where he had been, and he said he was walking to and fro, up and down in the earth, What's that mean? He was, go he was looking everywhere. And what was he trying to do? He was trying to find somebody to accuse. That, that's why he's called the accuser of the brethren. Every time that Satan sees something in your life that he knows God wouldn't accept, he takes it and runs to the throne of God and accuses you of not deserving the grace and the mercy that God had shown you. Essentially, he tries to get God to revoke your citizenship to heaven saying he don't deserve it but see we've got that advocate with the father the father looks to the son and the son says father let me testify about what I did for him I went to Calvary right I bore the sins of all mankind right I became that lamb slain before the foundation of the world then as you know I was buried I took the keys of the devil's house right into the grave he took the keys to death and hell then I rose victorious, took that blood. It's sitting right over there. They're in heaven. He points to it. It's that blood right over there on the mercy seat. He says, you see that blood, Father? I applied that to his life. He says, I testify of the fact that he is engraved in the palm of my hands. Right? I bear the, the marks in my body that he, that person, is free. That they're one of your children. What's that do? It delivers your soul from being condemned to hell. That witness that Jesus bears, eyes there. And if they need a sec second witness, we just think about him, the comforter, the Holy Ghost. God calls the Holy Ghost and says, hey, were you there when he got set? He said, oh yeah, I convicted him. And by faith, he asked Christ to save him. And I was there. I did the operation. He was like, I, he asked it to happen, and I did it. So you've got Jesus and the Holy Ghost both saying the devil's a liar. You know what that does? Proves him a liar. Because under the Old Testament, in order for something to be taken as fact, you need to have two or three witnesses. And the Father, being the judge, says, Well, Satan, you ain't got a foot to stand on. Get out of here. He can accuse all he wants to, but because of the faithful and true witness of the Son and the Holy Ghost, your salvation can never be changed. It can never be undone, not just because God promised it, but because once it's applied, the Father has no idea what Satan's talking about. He says, well, when I look at him, I see my son. So, son, what do you have to say about it? And he says, well, the reason you see your son is because the blood's been applied. And the Holy Ghost says, I can second that. I was there. I did the operation. But I indwell that person now so that their soul is forever preserved sinless. I've sealed them with what? The Holy Ghost, the promise that we just sang about. If the Comforter hadn't come, there would have been any way for your soul to remain sinless after you got saved. Because it is He that seals you until the day of redemption. But, second thing I thought about was a different courtroom setting. Now, not the movies and the TV shows and they're all inaccurate, but anyway. In a real courtroom, okay, let's look at Bible days. In a real court, they didn't call witnesses. Right? They had a public announcement of who was going to be put on trial. And they said, if anybody knows anything about this, show up. Right? They didn't have lawyers and such 
as we would think nowadays where there was you know a real formalized process right back then it was very much you may have somebody to speak on your behalf but it wasn't like nowadays okay the judge would stand up and say here's what you're accused of you got any proof that you didn't do it right somebody come and make the case against you and then the judge would say well does anybody have anything to say about this matter and it'd be your responsibility to jump up and say, I was there, I saw it. And the judge would call you forward and he'd say, well, tell us what you recall. Now see, it was your choice to show up to the courthouse that day. It was your choice to speak out. To raise your hand and to be counted as a witness. Nowadays, you get summoned to court. You don't have an option. If you get called and say, hey, we need you to testify, if you don't show up, they're going to come find you, and they're going to make you testify. And they might even put you in jail for ignoring a court order. But what are you saying? I'm saying back then it was all voluntary. John didn't say, well, I'm John. I got a brother named James. We're the sons of Zebedee. They call us the sons of thunder. Right, and I'm going to preach at you in a thundering voice until you get up and walk. Nope. When people said, how in the world did you do that? They didn't say, well, if you give us some money, we'll, we'll heal you too. Right, that's how you know all the faith healers are a bunch of nonsense. Because if it worked, you know where they'd be? They'd be down at hospitals. Without TV cameras. And they'd be putting St. Elizabeth out of business. But what were Peter and John a true witness? Why do you think God was able to use the early church so much? Because all they had, they didn't have this yet. All they had was what they had seen and what they had heard. Go back and read the epistle of Luke. Or not the epistle, the gospel of Luke. Then read the book of Acts. You'll find that in the beginning of both of those, Luke documents the process that he went through to verify that everything that was said was done of many witnesses, of many accounts, and they all matched. You know why he did that? To prove the naysayers that said, well, people just made it up wrong. He said, I went all over the known world. In the book of Acts, you find out that he went with the Apostle Paul on a few trips. What's he doing? He's asking everybody, now what would you hear? And they all said the same thing. We heard about Jesus, and Jesus came down and saved us. But what happened after that? Well, throughout the book of Acts, you're going to find there's a couple of different ways during the transitioning of when Christ was here until what we have today is salvation. There were a couple of different ways you could get the Holy Ghost. But nowadays, it's instantaneous. What happened? I got saved, and I got the Holy Ghost then. Right, so many people when they testify about what happened when they got saved, they say it felt like a weight was lifted off of me. That's scriptural. You know why? Because if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. You didn't have the bondage and the burden of your own sin anymore. That weight was lifted off of you. Why? Because Christ came in and liberated you from sin. You also didn't realize it, but He liberated you from the second death and from the grave. Anybody hear that song? Ain't no grave gonna keep my body down? Yeah. You know why? Because one day he's coming back, and if you do go through the grave, you're not staying there. Whatever's left over, he's gonna take and make it into a new body. You're gonna reunite with it. When that shout might sound like a trump with the voice of an archangel, come up hither. When that happens, you coming up. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? All those accounts matched. Even today. What's it feel like being saved? It's the best thing words can't describe. That's what people said back then. But a true witness delivers souls. Are we not called to be witnesses? Didn't Jesus say that when the Holy Ghost would come, you'd be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world? What's your duty day in and day out as a Christian? 
It's not to go out and get so caught up in the world that you forget about all of your responsibilities. Well, Brother Jordan, I don't, I don't lie, I don't cheat people, don't rob, don't steal. Good. You're not supposed to. But you know what you are supposed to do? You're supposed to go out and be a witness. And I've already said, being a witness doesn't change your situation. Whether you're a true witness or a false witness, you're saved on your way to heaven. Can't be a witness unless you already know what you're talking about. Well, in order to talk about Jesus, you've got to be saved. So in order to be a witness for Christ, you're going to heaven. The only decision that you have to make is whether you're going to witness and then what you're going to witness about. Well, so it says a deceitful witness speaketh lies. Deceitful is the condition, the lie is the symptom. Why does a deceitful witness lie? Because they're deceitful. Okay, well, what is deceit? It is deception. Deceit is manipulation. Deceit is intimidation. You know who that sounds like? It sounds like the devil. It's his goal to, when it comes to safe folks, intimidate you so that eventually he can dominate you. He wants to put you in such fear of speaking out and becoming a witness that he can dominate you and put you into a corner where you're too afraid to even mention the name Jesus out in public. You know why that is? Because he knows if there's one thing that's going to make a difference, it's what Jesus had planned. You being a witness. Go study the church. How's it handed down from one generation to the next? From believer to believer. By witness. You know what happens when you get up and you preach this book from behind this pulpit? Yes, you're preaching the Word, but you know how you're preaching it? Through the lens of your experience. When Brother Ron gets up, he and I could preach out the same verse. Right? He sees it different. Why? Because he's lived a different life than I've lived. The Holy Ghost has taken that verse and applied it to his life. But the Holy Ghost has also taken that verse and applied it to my life. So you can have two different witnesses of the same verse and they can tell you, here's how Jesus helped me with that verse. Does it make either one less true? No. Because I'm not saying Jesus didn't help him. He's not saying Jesus didn't help me. Just saying this is how Jesus helped us out of that verse. Right? I can only preach what it is that God has revealed unto me. I can only teach what the Holy Ghost has taught to me. When you get it, you're getting it through the lens of Brother Jordan's experience. Now the Holy Ghost takes what I'm doing and then applies it to your life the way that you need it to be applied. Right? That's why one person can preach and then everybody gets something different out of it. That's not because the preacher is that good. That's because the Holy Ghost took what you needed to hear and applied it to your life. Right? Go back to the song we sang this morning. Hallelujah, the Holy Ghost is here. Because if it was up to me to teach you, <laughs> we're up creek without a paddle. Right? There's a lot of stuff I can teach you, but it ain't going to help you spiritually. Only God can help you spiritually. If you want to learn about Star Wars, Brother Tommy and I are going to be having seminars on Saturday nights. For, I'm kidding. We can teach you about that. Right? You want to learn about weird stuff that you'll never need to know in your life. I watched a whole lot of How It's Made in History Channel growing up. Right? I know a whole bunch of weird stuff that's not going to help you. Right? But when it comes to being a witness, of, I can't witness what God has done in your life. I can't testify of what God's done for you. I can only be a witness of what God's done for me. I can only be a witness of what I've seen and what I've heard. Does that mean that two witnesses are going to tell different stories and that means one of them's a liar? No. Well, what are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm saying one person may have seen it from that side of the room. The other person may have seen it from this side of the room. They're going to see different things. They're going to have different perspectives. 
But certain things are going to line up. Right? Well, I saw them on the right side, and they had, you know, a mole on their cheek. And you ask the other guy from the other side of the road, did he have a mole on his cheek? Not on the cheek that I could see, but I can only see one cheek. Does that mean that one of them's lying? No, it just means they had different perspectives. Right? Well, what was he wearing? That's going to match up. What direction was he headed? Well, he's headed to my left, but to the door. And the other guy's going to say he was headed to my right, but he's headed to the door. Well, both of them, well, he was going in a different direction. No, he was headed toward the door. They was just looking in different directions. You say, that's silly. There have been court arguments over stupid things like that. Well, he must be lying. No, it's because you think they were standing right next to each other, but they're standing over here. Your perspective may be different from everybody else in the world, but it's your decision to give it. A deceitful wicked or deceitful witness takes what they've seen and they try to craft it into something else. For what purpose? For exploitation. For gain of themselves. For hatred of another. Bitterness, envy. We can go on all day long. There's a whole lot of reasons that people don't give a true account of what's going on in their life. But in order to be, if you are deceitful, when it comes for you to be a witness, what's it say you're going to do? You're going to lie. Most of the truth in a little bit of lie is still a lie. Most people, if they're really good, like I'm talking like Joel Osteen good, right? There's a lot of truth. Or there's a lot of what you can't argue with. God is good, yeah. Can't argue with that. He's altogether lovely. The Bible said, taste and see that the Lord is good. He's so good that you can just get a bite of the things that He's touched and taste His goodness. Right? But when it comes to how are you supposed to live, that's what just a little bit of life, just a little twist. Make it more convenient, more palatable. But the best liars don't just tell you a bold-faced lie. It's a subtle lie. What the devil do to Eve in the garden? He gave her a subtle lie. Just slipped one in, and then when she bit that one, he slipped another and another and another until what? Until eventually she believed a lie. Now, to her point, the only two people that I know of that she had ever heard talk were her husband Adam and God and now all of a sudden here's this other thing that talks right? the serpent that was the most beautiful thing in all the garden the Bible, the Bible says so if it can talk surely it's got to be of God well it was originally before he was kicked out of heaven for trying to usurp the throne of God Right? You can look through the eyes of man and say, well, it would make sense why she believed him. Doesn't matter, she knew the truth and she believed a lie. But why is Satan considered the father of lies? Because he's deceitful. Why is your heart deceitfully wicked where no man can know it? Because it's cursed by sin. It's going back to the ground. But you can let that heart start talking when it comes to you being a witness. And you know what's going to come out if you let your heart take over? If you let the flesh control your witness, it's going to be full of lies. Now, Brother Jordan, are you saying we're going to go out and say Jesus doesn't exist? Nope. The easiest kind of lie is a lie of silence. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. By not contradicting something that you know to be untrue, you've accepted that other people are going to hear the lie. Okay, now, this isn't going to happen. But, if I lost my mind and got up here and started reading out of a different version of the Bible, our pastor real quick going to jump up and say, what in the world are you doing? 
but I'm not getting too far into that outline. Okay, and for the record, the only reason I do that is to show you what one says so I can show you what the actual Word of God actually says. But if I lost my mind and did that, somebody's going to jump up, most likely the pastor, and say, hey, that ain't right. Now, he could sit there. You know our pastor. He's not going to. But he could. And what's going to happen if nobody says anything? Somebody that doesn't know any better is going to walk out of here thinking they heard the word of God. Why? Because other people didn't jump up and say, that ain't right. Your life as a witness will be contentious. There's a whole lot of people out there. I already told you the devil's going to try and intimidate you. There's a whole lot of people out there that'll make you think that saying what's true is bad for you. See all the rainbow people and all the letters that they want to be called nowadays, and if you call them anything else, then you're hateful. Hogwash. Or you've got the opportunity to stand up and be a true witness. But you know why it's so important for you to actually be a witness for Christ? Because you will deliver souls. I didn't say that you was going to deliver all of them to heaven. Because again, that's not up to you. The witness gets to decide whether they speak and what they speak about. To not say something when you know that the truth needs to be shared... That's considered a lie. A lie of omission, as they would call it. But to know what true is, and to stand up and proclaim, no, this is what the truth is. I'm not calling them a liar, but I know this to be true. Who decides whether or not somebody's lying or telling the truth? The judge. That's not up to you. It's not up to you to prove that the other person is a liar. It's your job to stand up and tell what you've seen and what you've heard. What you know. And see, part of being a witness is, is you've got to be able to withstand cross-examination. But how do you know that what you saw or what you remember is what you actually saw? Because i got a record of it right here. How do you know that Jesus did for you what you said that he did for you? Right? Because I know I'm completely different. Go back 20 years ago and ask somebody that knew me before I was saved. Right? Or ask somebody that knew me as a young Christian and then see, ask somebody that knows me now and see how I've matured, how I know more. Well, where in the Bible does it say that? You ever heard that one? To the discredit of most Christians, they can't reply and give them exactly where it says that. They got to say, well, hang on, let me go pull out my phone and search real quick and see if I can find it. We're supposed to be good stewards of the Word of God. We're supposed to be good students of the Word of God. Not just for your life, but so that you can help disciple the next generation, but also so that you can be an effective witness. If you would say, well, I saw that guy do this. Well, where did you see it happen? If you can't answer that, you're not a good witness. Well, it doesn't matter where I saw it or when I saw it. All I know is that I saw him do it. No, it kind of matters that you know where it happened so that you can prove yourself a valid witness. Does a true witness deliver a soul's? One of these days there is coming a judgment seat. Those that stand before the judgment seat of Christ are those that heard and received somebody else's witness and believed it is true. Now if I were to ask the question, because of your witness, how many people have come to the saving knowledge of Christ? 
The technical answer, if you want to be, okay, because it's me, can't hoodwink me. Technical answer is, well, nobody, Brother Jordan. We don't save people. The Holy Ghost saves people. I get that. But the question is, how many souls has the Holy Ghost used your witness to deliver somebody's soul from hell? Because the true witness delivers souls. It says it's promised. Now, are you saying, Brother Jordan, that if people haven't gotten saved because of what I've done for the Lord, that it means I, I'm not right with God or I'm not a good witness? No, go see Jeremiah. Because there's another option to that. A true witness may deliver somebody's soul to hell. Everybody should be presented with the choice, but you can't make the choice for them. Jeremiah proclaimed that death and destruction and judgment from God was coming and nobody believed him. Noah preached for a hundred years. Rain's coming and nobody believed him. You know what happened? Their souls were delivered to destruction. Just because nobody ever has doesn't mean you should stop because that person's going to stand before God one day and they're going to point at you and say well they never told me and God's going to have a record of where you did now I know that the world is without excuse to look around and see everything that was made and know that it wasn't created by man nor was anything that was created have any impact in creating something else this wasn't an accident. There was a grand design to it. You and I know that the very soul of man testifies to the fact that there is a God because it longs to commune with God. We know that man's without excuse. But some of us are going to hear God say, it's true they didn't tell you. But you had all these other reasons. You know what's going to happen in those instances? Their blood will be required at your hands. Because you were a deceitful witness. What are you saying? You were deceitful because maybe you were selfish. You were more concerned about what's going on in your life than in somebody else's life. I've said, a witness can see something. It doesn't mean they've got to show up at court and talk about it. A witness could see something, go to court, doesn't mean that they have to raise their hand and say, I want to testify as to what happened on that day. You can live your life trying to be as close as what you can be to Christ. You're not going to get very far if you're not interested in witnessing. Because all Jesus did was testify of what he had seen in the Father and what he had heard the Father say. He was entirely consumed with fulfilling the will of the Father, which was to go and tell. And what's He tell you to do? To go and tell. But you can try your best to live as you believe God wants you to live. But if you're not a witness, by default it means that you condone everything that's happening around you in your life. If a situation comes about and somebody says something, we've all had this too. Somebody will say something stupid or somebody will say something that's wrong and you've got that feeling deep right about here that says you ought to say something. But then, well, I don't want to offend that person. Well, maybe offending them is what it's going to take to actually get their attention. Maybe it's not about that person. Maybe there's somebody else with an earshot that needs to hear what God wants you to say. A true witness doesn't decide what they say. They just decide if they're going to say it. It's real easy being a witness for Jesus. He tells you everything to say. You don't have to make it up. He's got the perfect road map. How many times have you heard our pastor say, you don't have to tell them every deep theological, you don't have to have a PhD in the Bible in order to witness to somebody. 
to witness, all you got to do is tell what Jesus did for you. All you got to do is say what Jesus had to say on the issue. Now there's a little bit of responsibility there. You got to know what Jesus said in order to testify of it. You've got to know how to be saved in order to tell somebody else how to be saved. But all the heart, you don't have to sit down and study and come up with the answers to everybody else's problems. He gave you the same answers he gives to everybody else. It's just your choice whether or not to be a witness of it. Because if you don't say something, everybody else in the room, even though they didn't say anything, right? The perception is everybody agrees because they didn't say anything against it. Everybody knows when we have meetings at work, I'll sit there, I'll be quiet. But right before they're in, they're like, all right, anybody got questions? Anybody got comments? And then they'll look at me and say, what do you got to say? Because they know if I don't agree, I'm going to say it. I got no problem being contrary. Right? Because if I think it, I think it's worth saying. Right? If it was something silly, like I don't like the tie you're wearing today, I wouldn't say that. But if it's something about the meat of what we're talking about. You know why? Because contention, challenging things, if there is a problem, it's going to make it stronger. If it's not, it gives them a chance to actually defend their idea, and I'll say, all right, you didn't say that. If you'd have said that, I wouldn't have had my question. Right? But an echo chamber where what's just you repeat what everybody else says, that's not being a witness. By definition, a witness is willing to confront things that are contrary to what they saw. And they're willing to take whatever comes with that. Uh, well, I can't believe you said that. Was it true? Yeah. And that's all that matters. I didn't say it because I wanted to say it. I said it because God told me to say it. Take it up with God. You know what you're going to find? God told you to be a witness. Maybe I wouldn't have had to say it the way that I said it if you would have spoke up and said it in a nicer way. All I know is what I know and what I've seen and what I've saw. Again, you're getting my experience through my eyeballs. That's all I can testify of. But why didn't you do it this way? Because this is how I saw it. This is what God did for me. I can't change that. But I'm going to give a true account. Or, you can give an account full of lies. Deceitfully, you can give an account to where you gain out of the situation. That's called being a gainsayer. The Bible talks about them a lot. You can say certain things just to get a position. That's called being a hireling. There's a whole bunch of different ways that you can be a witness, but there's only one that's going to deliver people's souls. You don't get to decide what happens to the soul. They do. They can either receive it or they can reject it. You can't save that person. We've already said that's the job of the Holy Ghost. But I find that there are far too few witnesses. And that's causing a whole lot of people to go without hearing. Got far too few people that are actually delivering souls. In order to deliver a soul, you've got to be able to give a full account. Doesn't the Bible say that every man should be prepared to give an answer? of what God's done in his life. Doesn't say to give a partial of what God's done, an answer, a complete picture of what God did for you. And then you got to do it today. And wake up and choose again to do it tomorrow. And choose again to do it the next day. Brother Jordan, it may not be expedient for all of my errands in order to do that. Well, if God gets you caught up in something, God's going to take care of all the errands. And you'll find that you're going to be a whole lot happier doing what God told you to do than being busy about your business, being a Martha. Sometimes you just got to sit down at the master's feet and when he says, hey, tell what I did for you, get up and talk. 
front of everybody else. Too often we get caught up with the day in and the day out of the world and we don't think about the day in and day out of what Christ wanted you to do, which was be a witness. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.